Dear panelists, dear audience members, welcome to everyone who's joined us for the launch of two exciting new briefs, uh, awareness raising to prevent violence against women and fostering behavior change to prevent violence against women. Thank you very much for joining us today. We really appreciate. My name is Rita Niratunga. I'm a senior associate at the Prevention Collaborative. I'm very pleased to welcome you to today's session. Um, before we kick off, just a quick note on the meeting etiquette. Audience participants will remain muted. Yes, thank you for calling the slide. You remain muted, but we'll have uh, a question and answer box, which you are encouraged to use for your questions to panelists. And please, as we talk, feel free as you join to introduce yourself and mention the country you're joining us from. During this session today, we'll hear from Melissa Alvarado, who's the Ending Violence Against Women Regional Program Manager at UN, UN Women, who will give a brief overview um, why these two briefs I mentioned were developed and the joint work UN Women and the Prevention Collaborative in the Asia Pacific region have done. We will then hear um, presentations from Erin Stein and Lindsay McLean, both of them are senior associate at the Prevention Collaborative on the key highlights from the two briefs. This uh, will then be followed by reflections from Shrabana Data, knowledge management and monitoring analyst at UN Women in Bangladesh, who will speak to her experience with developing a behavior change communication strategy to prevent violence against women and girls. We will then have some space, as we said, for questions and answers from the audience before we wrap up the session for the day. Um, before we deep dive into the next part of this webinar, we would like to ask our audience a couple of questions to get us started, right? I know many of us here may be familiar with Mentimeter, but I will briefly uh, just for the sake of reminder to those who are not familiar, say how you can access and use the Mentimeter. You could click on the exact web address shown in the chat, or you could go to the Mentimeter website and enter the code that is shown on the screen, or else you can scan the QR code on the screen and enter your name. Please remember as you answer to hit submit for your answer to be displayed. Great. Now. Um, let us go through the questions we've uh, prepared for the Mentimeter. Tell us, please, something that made you smile today. Chocolate, great. Nasima. Right. Coffee in the morning, your husband. Yeah. Different things made us smile today. Thanks for sharing the answers. It can keep coming. Variety of answers. Coffee, coffee seems to be the thing that made people smile today. I guess those are people starting their days. Thanks for sharing with us. So can we go to the next question? And you tell us what do you think of when it comes to awareness raising to end violence against women? What do you think of when it comes to awareness raising to end violence against women? Take a minute and share with us. Yeah, not enough. We're not doing enough. It's important, but just a starting point. Yes, we need to do more. I agree. Thinking about prevention. Yeah, speaking out and public attention to the issue. That's good. Needs for holistic strategies. I agree. Campaigning during 16 days of activism. I can see 16 days of activism coming twice. Necessary, but not all. Yes, we need to add on that. Knowing where to report violence, sure. Yeah, need to move beyond that. 
Great. Yeah, answers are keeping coming. Primary and secondary prevention, good. Sharing information so a person understands what vow is and its harmful effects. Good one. Yeah. Many partners still need basic information. Not many people have the right education. Yes. Entertainment, interesting. Thanks for sharing all these answers. Involving the community at large and informing them like this. Great. So thanks for sharing these answers. Let's keep going to the third question. What do you think of when it comes to behavior change to end violence against women? We were looking at awareness raising. Now, what do you think of when it comes to behavior change to end violence against women? Please share your answers. A detainment. Good. Yeah, learning skills for healthy relationship. That's true. Long-term intervention, holistic approach. Yeah, for behavior change. Great, deep engagement that focuses on dialogue and reflection. Yeah, a long but worthy process. I can already see how people are nuancing between the two. Difficult, yeah, it is. Social norms, yes, for behavior change. Attention to structural barriers. So thank you so much. This is interesting to see how people are answering and then all the ideas we have about awareness raising and also behavior change to end violence. And thanks so much for your responses on those. We'll see how your understanding, our understanding of behavior change uh, and awareness raising resonates with today's session. So stay tuned for more on that. So I now hand over the floor to Melissa Alvarado to give us the brief overview. Melissa, please go ahead. Thank you, Rita, and greetings to everyone. It's really a pleasure to be with you. So as Rita mentioned, my name is Melissa Alvarado. I'm working with UN Women in our regional office for Asia and the Pacific and uh, really send greetings to all of you for joining us today uh, and welcoming our panelists and audience members today. So we have a really exciting lineup of speakers and look forward to engaging with all of you throughout the session. I wanna begin by acknowledging with gratitude the partnership of the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, which is supporting this work in progress. And uh, they have been an important and steady pro uh, partner with UN Women over the years. So the purpose of today's event is to launch these two briefs, one on awareness raising and one on behavior change, which are really meant to be utilized together, which the Prevention Collaborative and UN Women developed together. These briefs came about after we noticed that many programs in Asia and the Pacific region often highlight awareness raising as a key strategy to prevent violence against women and girls. And yet we also know that there is not so much strong evidence supporting the effectiveness of awareness raising alone to reduce or prevent violence. So we really have been in discussion for a long time with partners about where are sort of the limits of awareness raising and when does it sort of stretch beyond into behavior change work and, and how will we know what we need to do and when. To prevent violence, approaches focused on behavior change are necessary, yet the shift from awareness raising with sometimes uncertain results or results that have been challenging to measure to deeper behavior change is still happening. And so to help ease this transition, you and women and the Prevention Collaborative partnered to develop these two briefs um, and to help our partners sort of understand how to move beyond awareness raising into behavior change approaches. So they were designed to help answer questions from partners and colleagues working in countries around this region to support confidence building on prevention of violence against women by sharing practical tools really designed with the users at the center. So these two agencies are supporting growth, learning and confidence building 
on prevention of violence against women in this region and beyond. For instance, and here I will share just a couple quick examples. In Bangladesh, we have supported partners with the development of a strategic behavior change communication strategy through a learning series and tailored support that really builds on what practitioners at, you know, at the community level are doing and what they see as really important and necessary. And in Timor-Leste, we provided guidance to ongoing projects on prevention and organized training sessions related to prevention of violence against women to equip colleagues with essential knowledge and programming skills on what is primary prevention and evidence-based programming and, and how to blend in behavior change as we go. Earlier this year, UN Women, the World Health Organization and the Prevention Collaborative facilitated a deep exploration on how to localize the respect for, uh, framework to prevent violence against women and girls in, with uh, a network of, of participants from Bangladesh, India, and Nepal through a series of webinars with participation from government, civil society, and researchers in all three countries. This approach has, we think, has built confidence around prevention of violence against women programming and led to the development of new strategies on prevention in each country that are more evidence-informed. At the regional level, UN Women's Regional Prevention Strategy is guiding our work to accelerate prevention of violence against women in the region and identify challenges and entry points, which we've also developed with Prevention Collaborative. Today's event is part of this strategy, which aims to build the collective momentum to deepen and expand progress on prevention of violence against women and girls in Asia and the Pacific. So I am now so pleased to invite colleagues at the Prevention Collaborative, Erin Stern and Lizzie, Lindsay McLean to present. So Erin, I hand the floor over to you, thank you. Thank you so much, Melissa, and it's so great to be with you all today. Um, so I will be presenting some key findings as outlined in our joint brief, which has just been launched um, by the Prevention Collaborative and UN Women on awareness raising activities, which, as we know, are widely used and have a really important role to play in preventing violence against women and girls. So awareness raising activities encompass a real diverse uh, activities. And we started to look at those in the Mentimeter poll this morning. Um, they're often used when supporting violence prevention programs to increase knowledge about the causes and consequences of different types of violence. To also challenge attitudes, beliefs, and norms that condone violence against women and girls and to educate people about relevant laws, policies, services, or rights. Campaigns to advocate for violence prevention, such as the annual 16 Days of Activism Against Gender-Based Violence, which we are all at the end of, are also supported by awareness-raising activities. And awareness-raising activities range in design that can be one-off messaging to much longer-term programs, such as television or radio-based shows, or as part of ongoing activism campaigns. And awareness raising uses a variety of platforms to communicate messages, such as television, radio, podcasts, performances, music, social media, or workshops, as a few examples. They can be targeted to diverse audiences and also be intended for either individual or communal engagement. So kind of watching or participating, for instance, in a radio drama show together and then discussing it afterwards. Next slide, please. So in terms of what awareness raising activities can achieve, they are certainly attractive um, because they generate knowledge of relevant issues. They tend to be able to reach many people at a relatively low cost, especially compared to other types of violence prevention interventions. And for providing information to challenge gender norms or by attaching stigma to unwanted behaviors, awareness raising activities can be a helpful prompt to support shifts towards positive norms and prompt reflection on harmful norms that drive violence against women and girls. Awareness raising approaches can be really helpful to publicize relevant laws and policies, which can in doing so help send the message that violence is unacceptable. And awareness raising activities can support movements for women's rights and an enabling environment for women to exercise their rights by helping to build community buy-in or larger kind of political will. 
While awareness raising approaches are often considered to be a prevention strategy, they do also have a key role to play in response to violence against women and girls. For example, they can generate awareness of existing legislation or you know, where to go to report violence. What are the availability of services that exist in one's community? And this in turn can help reduce barriers to accessing support or affect decision-making of survivors to report violence or seek help. And awareness raising can also help break the silence and stigma of disclosing violence and support empathy and solidarity for survivors. For example, the Me Too movement seeks to empower women through strength in numbers by revealing how many women have survived sexual assault and harassment, especially in the workplace. And I think it's interesting to think about the role that awareness raising approaches can have to play in crisis situations like the COVID pandemic that we are still all grappling with, as many awareness raising strategies can be implemented remotely and safely during lockdowns or periods of social distancing. Next slide, please. So despite the importance of awareness raising activities, there is very limited evidence of their impact on preventing violence against women and girls on their own as a kind of standalone strategy. I think one of the reasons for this is that we're learning more and more in terms of intervention design and implementation of what works to reduce violence against women, of things like the importance of participatory group sessions, having opportunities to critically reflect on power and gender inequality, experiential learning, so practicing and applying skills, um, and efforts to support wider empowerment of women and girls. And it can be really difficult for awareness raising activities, especially short term or one way interventions to incorporate all of these features. Another reason I think of the limitations is that shifting attitudes towards violence against women and girls and gender equality, these are you know, typically beliefs and attitudes developed during childhood years and are continually reinforced in our society. And so shifting these typically takes more intensive interventions than awareness raising approaches typically offer. And even if awareness raising activities are able to shift attitudes and awareness, it does not necessarily lead to change behaviors. There's this nice diagram at the bottom where, you know, if, if people worked like this, but we don't, where we have a behavior, we then learn about something and then we change our behaviors. But we know that humans don't work that way. Um, we have a lot of experience, for instance, in public health, that people may know certain behaviors are harmful to them or harmful to others. They have a lot of awareness about those harms, but they continue to do those things. For example, um, if you think about public health campaigns around smoking. And another reason that awareness raising activities on their own can challenge, can be limited to change or prevent violence against women is that there are the social environments, as we know, are obstacles for individuals to actually change and sustain their behaviors. And to, so to support individuals to do so, it's really helpful if awareness raising activities are part of multi-component interventions and play a really supplemental role to other components. The next slide, please. I think it's still useful to reflect on, on how to do awareness raising more effectively um, as part of a really important component of these interventions. And awareness raising efforts are more likely to be impactful if they are tailored to the audiences they are intended to reach, encouraging people to think and feel something about what is portrayed and they can kind of, it feels relevant to them. So ideally messages should be pre-tested among target audiences to ensure they are relevant and understood correctly and to minimize any unintended negative effects like backlash. And to ensure accountability and that no one is excluded and everyone's voice is heard, a diversity of women should be consulted on the content and messages. Um, it's important to avoid messaging that promotes violence as normal or cultural. So as an example, a common awareness raising strategy is to highlight the prevalence of violence against women. For instance, the figure that one in three women have experienced domestic violence is widely used. But this figure may unintentionally normalize violence or portray it as part of culture, which could be used to justify violence. So it's important to be quite careful in terms of how this is disseminated. And also keep in mind that these global figures may not apply to every setting and rates might be quite a bit higher or lower depending on the setting that you're working in. 
we also know that effective awareness raising approaches should have sufficient intensity. Um, you know, one-off messaging is really unlikely to work for even just changing people's attitudes or awareness or as a prompt for a wider intervention. And positive aspirational messages, so such as highlighting the benefits of nonviolent or equitable relationships is much more likely to appeal to audiences than corrective messaging. So such as messaging that solely emphasizes the consequences of violence. And the latter can also unintentionally generate resistance or backlash. Finally, materials that tell people what to think rarely have as much impact on their attitudes or behaviors compared to materials that get people to have opportunities to question and have um, a space for dialogue and reflection. And while media has a really important role to spread information, it seems to be the follow-up conversations that become more influential over time. Next slide, please. So in summary, I think it's really important to be realistic about what different types of violence prevention and response strategies can and are also unlikely to achieve on their own. And awareness raising activities can definitely contribute to preventing violence against women and girls. And I think have a particular role to play in spreading new ideas and generating knowledge and helping and ensure really wide reach. They are more effective when they are carefully targeted and also relatable to the audiences intended, when they rest on positive messaging and when there also are opportunities for dialogue and reflection. They are also especially feasible and relevant amidst crises like the COVID-19 crisis, given the restrictions on mobility and face-to-face -face work. But awareness raising activities are also more likely to reduce violence when embedded as a strategy among interventions that address multiple drivers of violence and incorporate features and best practices to support behavior changes. And my colleague, Lindsay McLean will talk through more about um, how interventions can do that. So before we hand over to Lindsay, I wanted to just have a chance for a poll. And I also see that there are some questions in the chat, which we will come back to in the Q&A. Um, but if you can go to the Mintimeter again um, on the same uh, link, the first thing that we wanted to ask in response to this presentation is what is one thing that stands out to you that awareness raising can do really well? If you can just take a minute to respond and reflect um, either something that came up from today or something in your own experience and reflections on what you find awareness raising can do really well. So we have, yeah, getting the conversation started, helping to draw attention on a larger scale and to inform, creating dialogue and helping survivors feel that they're not alone, which of course has a really important role. And just getting to people to start talking. So it's interesting thinking about sometimes the um, timing or sequencing of activities. And I think awareness raising can play a really important role at the beginning of interventions. Um, and kind of complement to other activities, highlight where services are available. So as we were discussing, I think having a really important role in response as well. Um, in terms of what is considered violence, yeah, educating on how to identify different types of violence and, and kind of those nuances of different types of violence. I think awareness raising absolutely has a really important role for that. Um, Encouraging victims of violence and to support, to report. And again, interesting thinking about the different audiences that awareness raising can target. So this example here of making authorities understand the issues first. So if you're doing awareness raising specifically targeted to your work with authorities, it can be really helpful for that initial understanding and engagement. Okay, great. I think we're ready for the next question. So if you want to just click on the Mentimeter next question, the next one we have is what is one thing that stands out to you that awareness raising is unlikely to do on its own? So 
So again, anything that came up from today's discussion or in your own experiences and practice of, of challenges or what where the limitations are of awareness raising on its own. So a lot on kind of awareness ways and actually being able to change behaviors on its own. And to bring longer term change in attitude. So that's interesting. I've been thinking about awareness raising might help start to initially shift people's attitudes, but what do we need to actually help people sustain that shift? Um, and also this, this note on how do you shift policies? It needs more than just awareness raising. And discussion on objections to some information shared during awareness raising. So I think this you know, again, having a space to reflect on potential backlash or what people disagree with and helping kind of people work through that. Um, provides insights to think differently, but we need skills to actually change behaviors. And that's a great um, prompt into the behavior change discussion. We'll be talking more through that. So again, equipping people with skills to actually resolve conflict or prevent violence. And this note about wider policy change that it's unlikely on its own um, for awareness raising to change policies. Great, well, this has been really helpful. Uh, thank you for contributing to the Mentimeter and we'll be able to come back and discuss, but I think this uh, lends really nicely now to hand over to Lindsay McLean, also from the Prevention Collaborative, who's now gonna speak more about the behavior change complementary brief that will go more into how to diagnose, identify, and help um, change behaviors through our interventions. So over to you, Lindsay. That's great. Thanks very much, Erin, and welcome to everyone who's here. So yes, I'm gonna talk about the second brief, uh, the sister brief to the one Erin has just spoken about. And this brief focuses on how we can actually foster behavior change to prevent violence against women. So the brief, like the first brief, it aims to set out a comprehensive, but also an accessible process to support behavior change programming. So it's particularly targeted at practitioners who are interested in applying behavior change approaches um, to violence against women prevention programs. So in putting together the brief, um, we actually looked at, we reviewed a wide number of different theories and approaches that are out there to understand behavior change. And what all of these approaches have in common is their aim to really identify and understand the multiple and interlocking factors which enable or hinder behavior changes. Next slide, please. So the brief puts forward, based on this review, the brief puts forward five key steps that we think are really important to follow in order to try to design interventions to um, change behaviors to prevent violence against women. I'm gonna go through these in a moment, but just as an overview, firstly, it's obviously about identifying which specific behavior or behaviors of specific actors we're actually trying to change. Then we look at the main drivers of those behaviors in the particular context where we're working. And then we're gonna be designing interventions to actually address those specific drivers. Also thinking about strategies to really reinforce and embed behavior change over the longer term. And finally, a really important step that we'll also discuss is this sort of ongoing monitoring to really collect data so we're understanding whether and how the intervention or interventions we have designed are leading to the desired behavior change. So I'm going to unpack these in more detail now. So next slide, please. So the first step is, as I said, to identify the specific behavior or behaviors of particular actors that we're trying to change. Now, obviously, in our work on prevention of violence against women, the key harmful behavior is the perpetration of that violence. That's the ultimate the behavior that we are trying to change. However, there may be other behaviors that also need to change in order for us to make steps towards actual 
actually preventing that violence and wider gender equality to enable violence prevention. So for example, in the case of intimate partner violence, yes, ultimately we want the, the if it's in a heterosexual relationship, we want the man to stop perpetrating violence against women. But there may also be other behaviors that we want to change, such as for example, his ability to communicate well and negotiate and li listen actively to his partner or his engagement in um, domestic labor um, in, in the home, or his engagement in parenting um, with, of, of the couple's children. So, and in some cases, we can actually see that it's several behaviors of several different actors that need to change in order to change a harmful practice or behavior. So in the box here, we can see the example of reducing child marriage. So if we're trying to design a program to reduce child marriage, we actually need to target several behaviors of several actors. Firstly, parents. So we actually need parents to shift their behavior so they no longer seek out uh, marriage partners for their child, and they no longer give permission when somebody else approaches them for their, for their child's hand in marriage. Equally, we need to work with religious leaders and we actually need religious leaders to change their behaviors. So they now refuse to conduct the marriage that they would normally um, marry children. They now refuse to do that. And finally, we'd also need to work with the children. And there we'd, we'd be trying to shift the behaviors of the children. So they're actually able, they feel confident and they actually express their own wish not to be married. Next slide, please. So once we've actually identified the specific behaviors of specific actors that we um, want to target, we now need to unpack what um, actually are the drivers of those behaviors. So what is needed to bring about change? What drives change? And research shows us that if we want to influence a change in an individual's behavior, we need to look at both that individual's agency, and so their own sort of capacity and ability and motivation to act, as well as how their agency and their ability to act and change their behavior is enabled or constrained by the broader social and institutional environment in which they are living or, or working or studying, whatever that context is. Next slide, please. And so the approach that we have chosen to include in this brief to actually analyze uh, drivers of behaviors is called the COMBI framework. And this is a framework that we find is both accessible and also um, pretty good at analyzing all the drivers we, we need to look at. So the COMBI framework um, basically analyzes and says that a behavior is driven by three different types of factors, capability, motivation, and opportunity factors. So firstly, capability factors are the actual physical or psychological ability of a person to enact a behavior and also to change a behavior into another behavior. So here we may have factors such as their knowledge, um, their, their skills to enact a particular behavior, and also their capacity to understand, to comprehend, and to reason. So these kind of factors are in the sort of domain of capability. Secondly, uh, we also need to address motivation factors. So behavior is also driven by people's motivation. And some of those motivations may be reflective, so where people are actually reasoning and making decisions, and some actually may be automatic. So here we're looking at what a person's goals are, for example, what their beliefs are, but also what their habits are as well. So those first two factors, capability and motivation, are very much about um, an individual's capacity and an individual's motivation. But the third factor, opportunity, is also looking at this wider environment. So these are the physical and social factors in the context, so they're outside of the individual, but in the context in which they are living or working, which, which make this behavior, which either enable or constrain this behavior. So this may include resources that are available, so financial resources potentially, it might be around laws, or also it might be around the social environment. So what are the predominant social norms in an environment? So for example, that might, um, if, if you take the case of a man who is maybe perpetrating violence against his intimate partner, 
he will be looking more widely at those social norms. And that's both about what he thinks other people are doing in his environment. What's the common behavior? Are other men beating what their wives? But also about what he thinks others expect him to do. So he may believe there's an expectation that if his wife speaks out against him, for example, that he would then beat her in response to that. So these are opportunity factors um, in that wider environment. Next slide, please. So just to take an example, we're going to do a Mentimeter again in a moment to get some participation. So let's just imagine for a moment that we are um, designing a program which is aiming to promote positive discipline of children by parents. So we're in a situation where we're trying to reduce harsh, harsh physical discipline and beating of children by their parents. So we want to try to promote positive discipline which capability, motivation, opportunity factors might you need to address? So I can just kindly ask my colleague to share the Mentimeter with us. We're just going to get your inputs on that. OK, so. I think the Mentimeter is up there. Sorry, my, yeah, there it is. So yes, yeah, so just a reminder, as you're um, going to menti.com and using that code, um, we are looking at the example of where we want to design a program to promote positive discipline of parents, uh, by parents of their children. So which capability, motivation, opportunity factors might you need to address when designing this program? So I'll just give you a few moments to enter the Mentimeter and um, to put some of your ideas. And if you can mark them as C, M and O as you submit your ideas, that would be really helpful. Okay, I've got a first contribution coming up on the screen here, which um, this person has identified a motivation factor for parents, which is the belief that children have agency and can engage in dialogue about behaviours as opposed to only responding to discipline. So thank you. I've got a couple of uh, capability factors coming up. So um, one is about that's interesting, the self-confidence of parents um, on their ability to ask for help. And another capability is actually having training. So I presume building skills in um, positive parenting and how to, to parent in a positive manner. Just give it a couple of minutes if some of you are typing. Okay, so another, another couple of contributions here. So firstly, under capability factors um, that the parents would have communication techniques and skills and conflict resolution skills. Um, and there we've got a motivation factor. So you've put cultural norms around normalization of violence. So again, I think that can be both perhaps an opportunity factor around the cultural norms around us, but it also can be a belief that we've internalized as an individual motivation as well, that um, a belief that normalization, that, that, that um, disciplining children and physically disciplining children is the right thing to do. We've also got here um, a motivation um, around notions of gender equality in parenting. So I guess, I guess that is working on parents' belief um, about the importance of gender equality and that that can bring um, a positive contribution to the upbringing of children. Um, and here I've got capability. Yeah, skills. So skills to try out other means of parenting that are not violent, for example. And then someone else, yes, there again has talked about social norms in the opportunity factors. So the community social norms around children's role in the family. So this might be informed by social norms around um, the importance of physically disciplining your children, but also more general social norms around what we think the role of children are and who children are in our society and families. And then a motiv another motivation here that's, I think, really useful is um, the belief in, in parents that their kids will grow up better without violence. OK, well, thanks. There's lots of different um, contributions there. So if we can just return back to the presentation. Thanks to for all of you for your 
um, for your inputs. So yes, I've got a couple of things up there. I think you covered most of those, which was about, yes, supporting and capability. It's particularly important to support parents to develop the knowledge knowledge of and skills to use alternative and healthier forms of discipline. And the motivation, yes, persuading parents to use alternative discipline and to avoid the negative consequences of harsh discipline. So that's about their, them knowing uh, the consequences of harsh physical discipline and them actually believing and understanding that positive parenting is better, as well as the opportunity structure. So you, many of you talked about the, the social norm structure that needs to change. And also another kind of important thing in the opportunity structure could be about providing a safe space where parents can connect with each other and actually learn from each other around using positive discipline of, of children. So that shifts that social environment. Next slide, please. So the third step, so once we've actually identified the behaviors we wanna change and looked at the drivers of those behavior, we then need to design interventions to actually address those behavioral drivers. And here I'm gonna draw on um, the behavior change wheel that goes together with the combi model. And the, the citation for that is given at the, the, the bottom of the slide. So basically the behavior change wheel suggests strategies to influence the drivers identified in the combi analysis. So you can see in the center of the wheel here in green, we've got those capability, opportunity and motivation factors. And then this blue ring around the edge of that, these are the interventions that we can use to address um, those drivers. So you can see here, there's, there's quite a long list and these are covered in some detail in the brief um, from things like education to incentivization, enablement, coercion. And if we can just go to the next slide, I'll just unpack a couple of those just to give a couple of concrete examples. So for example, if we were to use the strategy of modeling, this means that we will be providing our target groups with an example um, for people to aspire to or imitate. And a, and a good example here would be in a, um, a program that works with, with fathers and, and male partners, where actually um, through the program and through the training, some fathers would then be actively engaged with domestic and care work, and they would be modeling alternative norms alternative behaviors and sort of targeting, if you like, the norms of fatherhood. So this kind of strategy of, of training people and then then modeling for others really tackles kind of motivation factors um, that, that can be driving particular behaviors. Secondly, the strategy of training, as we've been hearing, training is not just about knowledge and awareness raising, training can also be about imparting and building skills. So for example, a, a curriculum working with couples might uh, work with couples on their emotional regulation skills to help mitigate and solve conflicts peacefully. So this is addressing a capability um, driver of behavior. Next slide, please. And the fourth step, and here we're going to the outer ring of the behavior change wheel in gray. This is also about needing to actually then include sort of further strategies that really try to kind of reinforce and, and embed behavior change in the longer term and, and often beyond the life of a particular program or initiative that we might be implementing. So in the gray area here, you can see a range of strategies. And again, there are examples of all of these strategies in the brief. If we can go to the next slide, I'll just um, unpack a couple of them as examples. So firstly, in the area of fiscal policy, this is where we may actually use the tax system or government may use the tax system to reduce or increase the financial cost of a particular behavior. So a sort of simple example here is where governments may increase the tax on alcohol. So they've recognized that Alcohol is a, um, a driver of violence, so they would increase tax on alcohol in order to reduce excessive consumption. So this is backing up strategies of incentivization, coercion and training. And then secondly, guidelines. This is where we create documents that recommend or mandate practice. An example that there might be a national curriculum that actually includes um, um, comprehensive sexuality education. And there, these guidelines are really trying to build on other interventions around enablement and persuasion and incentivization. Next slide, please. 
And so the fifth step, um, just briefly, is about making sure that we're actually monitoring. While we're implementing these interventions, let's monitor if and how interventions are leading to the desired changes. So this, for example, there are a variety of approaches here that are mentioned in the brief, and you can look at links in the brief. But this could be around um, getting self-reported baseline and endline data about violence um, perpetration or experience of violence. You could use qualitative and participatory approaches, for example, interviewing couples during an intervention with couples, interviewing them regularly to assess how their communications and conflict resolution skills are changing. You may also do um, process evaluations of a, of a program, really to see, well, to what extent was that edutainment campaign actually relevant to the audience and did they connect with it? So there are a variety of methods to monitor if and how you're actually achieving these behavior changes. Next slide, please. So finally, um, just want to point out some of the sort of in summary, what are some of the implications of what we've laid out in this brief? So I hope we've sort of been able to communicate that behavior change is a gradual, complex and lengthy process that can require sustained investments over time. So you might need an immediate sort of intervention, but also strategies and policies to kind of embed and reinforce behavior change. I hope you can also see that we need multifaceted strategies because the drivers of behavior are quite varied. We need to focus on winning people's hearts and minds, also winning over the wider crowd in the social environment, and also shaping that environment to induce positive actions. And one size is unlikely to fit every situation as we often see in our work. So we do need to carefully design interventions to address the specific behaviors of specific actors in specific contexts. And then just that reminder that throughout this, we've been looking at drivers that are at the individual relationship and community and institutional level. So very much like the social ecological model that many of you know, where we have risk factors at those different levels, we also have drivers of violence at those different levels that we need to address. Next slide, please. Okay, so thanks very much. So I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Shravana Dutta, who works with UN Women Bangladesh, and is going to talk to us about um, her work to develop, to use this approach to develop a behavior change communication strategy with partners in Bangladesh. And just a reminder to put any questions in chat, and we will come back to those after Shravana has spoken. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lindsay. And um, it's good afternoon, good morning, and good uh, evening, colleagues. Thank you for all joining today. I am Srabana Dattu from UNOM in Bangladesh. For us, the experience of actually developing the behavior change communication strategy uh, remained a very, um, uh, uh, like a educative and also pioneering. It is now a very good opportunity for us to share our experience with you all who are interested to develop and implement the behavior change communication strategy and some behavior change materials. In the next slide, uh, before explaining um, the, how we have developed actually the BCC strategy, uh, let me share the background of the primary prevention program that we are currently implementing in Bangladesh. It is uh, a, a primary prevention program, much more uh, focuses on the um, prevention strategies and also uh, focuses on the stopping violence before it occurs to element, eliminate violence against women in Bangladesh. The project is implemented in the local level instead of the national level, while we have uh, much more uh, seen the practices are. In three districts, we have implementing this, and it actually involves a holistic range of evidence-based prevention approaches to intervene at family and community level, public spaces, tertiary level educational institutions, workplaces that includes both the local government um, public offices and also the private offices like Chamber of Commerce and factories as well. At the policy level, the project conducts um, advocacy for enactment and implementation of favorable laws, policies, and strategies, and also strengthens the knowledge base and evidence on effective strategies to prevent violence against women in Bangladesh. Uh, next slide, please. Um, 
while developing the business strategy, we uh, definitely actually followed the step that Lindsay mentioned in our uh, presentation. And there were like multiple virtual workshops that we organized with the partners, especially with the local partners. And then um, they worked on the identifying key target groups based on like uh, mapping the stakeholders that is available in the field and uh, behavior drivers and analyze the current interventions to change behavior. The whole process actually followed a bottom-up approach to understand the theory of change and also um, more uh, focused on the entire process of like, you know, um, embed the behavior change materials within the existing prevention interventions instead of developing a standalone prevention approach for uh, or something very new uh, for the program as well also. So in the next slide, uh, since uh, CGB project actually works with multi-layered and multi-sectoral stakeholders, both at uh, national and local level. So when we are actually developing the, um, the business strategy, in the first initial step, we had to do a mapping of the target groups that we would like to have the behavior change. And then the list is quite exhaustive. But for today's session, I have picked up a few examples which we, you all can relate with. And for today's session, I will be much more focusing on the community level interventions. But um, we have a couple of questions actually came out in our previous session as well. So on like you know, how to change the behaviors of the the duty make uh, the duty bearers or the lawmakers, then we can actually um, discuss during our question and session as well. Also, uh, so in here, what we have is that like for, for community based interventions, we have the primary target groups, which is mainly potential the male perpetrators coming from different backgrounds, like supervisors, factory supervisors, government officials male teachers from the educational institutions, even the male students, even within the senior and junior students as well, and men in public spaces. And we would like to have uh, their behavior change as a, like, you know, when men speak and about uh, women colleagues or their fellow uh, students with respectful, positive languages, as Erin um, mentioned about, like, you know, we would like to promote more like positive messaging and instead of just a negative regressive messaging. At the same time, men also keep a respectful distance and behave kindly uh, towards women in public spaces so that we uh, they do not perpetrate physical or sexual harassment uh, in within the public spaces. Um, next slide uh, about the combi model that um, Lindsay has mentioned is that um, we want to change, like, you know, this is an example how we have actually analyzed the behaviors of drivers and then what we would like to have as a desired future behavior. So currently the men perpetrate are perpetrating physical and sexual harassment against the female colleagues or like, you know, students or employees at the public spaces or also in the, uh, their, within their workplaces. It can be either educational institutions or government officials or any kind of like, you know, uh, private workplaces. And we wanted to change the behavior of the men speaking and about the colleague of women colleagues, um, like, you know, in a respectful, positive language. At the same time, also, they are um, keeping a respectful distance and behaving kindly to the women at the public spaces. The capability is that uh, we wanted to have is that men have an improved knowledge of mutual uh, harmful impacts of sexual harassment. And also the opportunity they could be actually bring together is that more women are in the senior positions in the institutions instead of just like unequal power hierarchies within the institutions and men put into the more uh, superior positions. There would be a safer public transport with zero tolerance to sexual harassment and also public infrastructure are designed uh, for women's safety. The motivation that also Lindsay mentioned in her presentation is that, I mean, like, you know, we wanted to have a change behavior that children grow up in a violence-free household. At the same time, men also embrace a more um, fewer rigid ideas of successful manhood from what men believes currently right now to perpetrate violence with impunity and also inequal behavior towards uh, women and girls. Next slide, please. And um, as we mentioned that uh, in our existing um, 
current be interventions of the current change behavior that we have to, through the prevention uh, approaches. We are implementing currently right at the moment the SASA together, which most of you are familiar with at the community level. And the, uh, the target group is we have these two different groups who are actually directly uh, rolling out and also um, reaching uh, to the community members. One is the community activist and the co another group is the community leaders. So the basic difference between an activist and the community leader is that community leader is much more like you know, elected or traditional or they can actually use their uh, reinforce the ideas of prevention and leverage their roles and positions and platforms to influence and shape the new norms and which is much more like uh, on um, trying to support the couples at the same time, also the family members, the community members, uh, neighbors, or like, you know, to encourage uh, like, you know, critical reflections and also to support the women who are actually experiencing violence on um, like for referral mechanism and also for like, you know, access to GBV services. Uh, next slide, please. So how we have developed the materials instead of like, you know, going through a lot of like, you know, exhaustive list of materials and instead of going through a lot of materials that we usually have, that's like, you know, program people usually face challenges to like, you know, focus on this. So for this, uh, we are actually focusing on two uh, materials. One, two, both of them as a posters, and then one is targeting to the community activists that I mentioned earlier. And this is placed on the community centers, mosques and clinics and other hotspots. And there is also another poster promoting with the more like a healthy relationship and nonviolent relationships among family members and also with couples. As you see that the target group for these two are, even though it looks like very similar, but then the behavior drivers and the messages that we would like to convey, it's a little bit different. So when designing a or developing a BCC materials, then it's also very much um, it has to be reflected because we always promote that it needs to be, the materials need to be embedded within the existing interventions. So SASA has a, like a community interventions, more like, you know, reaching out to the, uh, for preventing violence against women and in the society. So within this materials, so it actually uh, empowers uh, the, uh, the survivors as well as also the community members that, so that the men and women can help each other and then also use when the designing is being done, it's not only a um, illustration only or only a text only, it is also an illustration at the same time also um, putting some messages, positive uh, language messages then so that I mean like you know, it conveys what we are actually trying to achieve or what we'd like to change in within our behavior. As um, here you can see that we have emphasized on using the local language which is Bangla for Bangladesh. And then any country who is actually not like, you know, if it is not English, then they can also have um, it in their own native language as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, measuring, because um, the fourth step, we have to think about like, you know, how we are changing, uh, how we are actually measuring the changes that we have been going, uh, like, you know, uh, do, trying to achieve. And then currently we are doing for these two posters that we have done the materials, we are actually doing uh, two different types of tools that we are using. One is actually the community members, they are sharing the data of violence uh, in the community leaders during their monthly consultation sessions. So this kind of sessions is just like, you know, it's also like, it's not only the particularly focusing on the VOW data, but then rather uh, it's also includes a different kind of discussions and also more like, you know, promotions of uh, uh, positive messaging uh, from SASA as well, for behavior change messaging as well. And then there is this focus group discussions with the community members to assess actually their understanding and reflection on healthy relationship among the family members, especially emphasizing on the couples that within the family members that have also have. And interpersonal uh, uh, intimate relationship is also focused on. And with the uh, next slide, um, uh, we come to an end, and with that note, I would like to uh, invite Melissa to um, moderate the panel discussions, and I would be very happy to answer any kind of questions that is also related to um, the, how we have experienced the implementing of the business development uh, strategy development. Thank you so much, Shravana, for sharing some insights from your experience and the context in Bangladesh where I know that there's been an enormous amount of investment in 
responding you know, more effectively to violence against women and really sharpening and deepening our abilities around prevention and engaging with very strategic stakeholders as you've just described. So, so helpful, even for you, know, you to explain how you're trying to measure changes at community level. It's so important to share those experiences. So we really value uh, that you've brought that to this session. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so I see that into, we've, we've had a few questions that have already come into the Q&A. We've uh, touched on them a little bit as we've been going through our session, but we do want to come back to a, to a few of them. Um, and so uh, there was a, an important question, uh, which I'm going to, to read uh, from Sona. What if we raise our voice and it is suppressed? I mean, I think that's a great question because there's so many ways that that could happen, right? We might raise our voice in our relationship, in our family, in our community, in our workplace. And, you know, and, and we might feel that we're not fully heard or we might be dismissed. Um, so it, I'd like to hear from uh, others on the other speakers about this. And perhaps Shravana, do you wanna maybe offer a first insight about that? Any reflections on that particular question about how you might see that happening? Uh, thank you. Actually, I saw two questions. One is from Rekha from Bangladesh about like you know changing the behaviors of the lawmakers, mm -hmm. and then another one I think was uh, from um, yeah, and then also like you non know, social leaders. I think the example that I actually showed in my presentation actually kind of addresses the social leaders because um, community leaders that through whom we are actually implementing Sasa together, they are the social leaders. They have the, their like you know religious leader or like you know social um, positions they can actually use and reach out to the communities members in general. So this is like you know postering is one kind of way to do that that thing that you know create some kind of like you know behavior change communication. Um, postering kind of thing materials at the same time there can be also radio messaging or also like PSAs and then it can be transmitted but then it has to be uh, in regular interval at the same time also in frequency so it cannot be just like a one-time kind of thing it has to be consistently so there are some examples where uh, I think in um in African countries, they had this radio messaging or like the radio shows, like, you know, a small skit, like, you know, going on for 10 months. So these are the type, type of things that you actually do more. Um, <clears throat> you can actually, uh, you know, um, implement. And then on the question on the lawmakers, because the lawmakers, it is not... Um, what is actually the current behavior of lawmakers? They don't have an investment and they don't have the willingness to do the changes on like, you know, the GBV policies or um, GBV um, sexual harassment, enactment of the sexual harassment laws. And then also they don't actually look for um, willingness to increase the investment or budgeting or financing on that or general response budgeting they don't want to implement. And then we would like to see that they have more contribution investment and also they would like to have uh, their institution more accountable. So when we talk about the institutionalization of accountability within the institutions, then it has to, it cannot be just a fostering. So as I mentioned in that PCC materials and it's a, it's an embedded, um, it's an embedded uh, Material, So it is not a standalone kind of thing that you just only have a poster and then it will be changing. So it comes with like, you know, when we talk about the lawmakers for um, making the duty bearers accountable, you also have to have an, like, you know, initiative capacity building of the staff at the same time duty bearers on like, you know, implementing the so sexual harassment policies within their institutions, establish a committee and also like the, establish the referral mechanism. At the same time, when you talk about the BCC materials, then you see that um, you can have a postering on like, you know, on the enabling environment that you have established, like, you know, you have established uh, the complaint boxes. It is being mentioned, like, you know. So this kind of things needs to be embedded. It is not a, like a, uh, what we, and I think I also have the same, uh, issue understanding the difference between like you know the intervention a prevention pro intervention at the same time also BCC at I was also like you know separating the two things whereas it is actually complementing each other yeah over to you thank you thank you Shravana and I think that's a really important point that you've just ended with where you know we really see our approaches as blended 
and complementing each other if we're working, you know, and I think I think that's really part of our strategy to work across the ecological model, right? For those of us who've been working on violence and prevention for a while, we're thinking at, you know, what are the bigger sort of legal frameworks that are driving, that might be driving behavior? You know, is there no accountability for violence almost ever? You know, uh, is there no justice? Uh, and, and how does that inform people's behavior, you know, in, in communities, other leaders, maybe media? So all of these things, all of these different layers of our society really inform each other right down to our, our experiences with our partners, with our families and relationships. So I think that's a critical point that we want to be working at so many different layers and, and complementing and blending. So thank you so much for your insights from, from your context. Um, I feel like these questions are so good that I want to I want to bring insights from from the other speakers too. So I'm going to turn next to to Aaron. Um, you know, perhaps you'd like to offer a quick uh, reflection on um, the question around you know what if we raise our voice and it's suppressed? Uh, I think you know we we all have maybe a different take on that. Um, how do we work with lawmakers specifically? You know, there's been a couple of questions actually about how do we work with decision makers and, and, and lawmakers specifically. And I know you've already spoken a bit to the combi question, but maybe you want to add to that. So over to you, Erin. Thanks, Melissa. And, and thanks for that great question around, you know, whose voice matters and whose voice counts. And I think just one comment in response to that is the importance of taking a really intersectional approach to our awareness raising. Um, so ensuring kind of accountability and that no one is excluded. Um, and to do that, I think one important tip, and this is also referenced in the brief, is ensuring a, a diversity of women. So inclusive of things like age, ethnicity, class, disability, um, gender identity, etc., are consulted on the content and messages and have ownership of the content and, and messages. And I think um, part of it is also monitoring you know, the response to it and, and whose um, reality counts. And I think that actually really ties nicely to a question in the chat around how do we avoid the backfire effect? Because when we push for rain, raising awareness, especially of more marginalized voices, there might, um, it can, it creates tension, right? It can be addressing these entrenched kind of power dynamics. And um, how do we want to kind of mitigate that? And I think, again, coming back to you know, some of the tips, and I think it's great that Shravan has shared, you know, the experience with programs like SASA, which I think has done a really good job at developing media and communication materials that strive to envision kind of nonviolent realities and more positive realities and offer a credible case that resonates in the local context and try to avoid blaming and accus accusations of characters, try to maintain the dignity of characters, try to kind of mitigate the potential for backlash. Um, also trying to publicize the commonality or the benefit of positive norms rather than challenging kind of these entrenched negative norms. But I think there is, you know, inevitably sometimes, I think this is a broader question of violence prevention programming, there may, will be resistance and backlash. And so there, no matter kind of how positive and aspirational, and if you take these kind of design approaches in mind, this work can be triggering and can be challenging um, these kind of bigger structures. So I think it's still important that we monitor that and think about how to, um, um kind of you know we're trying to unintentionally we, we want to make sure we're not unintentionally generating resistance or backlash in the way that we communicate but also that the messaging in itself might do so um so i think that's a really great question and one kind of that we grapple with within all programs not just awareness raising um and then finally the question on yeah lawmakers i think i think you know i hope this um, the BCOM diagnosis, what I think is helpful is sometimes just reflecting on who you're working with, you know, people that you, in, in a particular target audience or group might be really motivated or they might have a lot of capability, but they just don't have the opportunity. I think with lawmakers, it obviously depends on which lawmakers and in which context, but I do think the opportunity level factors tend to be really important for lawmakers. So things like what is their own power dynamics to make and enact laws or who are their hierarchies and authorities and how are they being um, kind of viewed in this work and what are the you know 
the kind of policies or expectations of them as lawmakers. Um, I, you know, an example from the field is, is um, I worked very closely with a program in Dasha Kirwa in Rwanda, and there was a series of work working with opinion leaders and kind of having them critically reflect on power dynamics and a lot of the content of the program. And a lot of them were saying to the staff, well, you need to talk to my boss because I'm constrained. I may believe and want to be a part of this, but I'm in this kind of broader system of being a kind of policymaker. And so I think it really does come back to knowing your context and knowing your audience. But I think especially with lawmakers, we have to give a lot of attention to the environment that they work in and the opportunity level, both constraints and enablers. Um, and so, yeah, I think I'll leave it over to any other um, comments and questions. Thanks. Very good, thank you. Um, I see, uh, and maybe I'll just offer a couple quick reflections on what you've just said. I mean, I think that um, thinking about behavior change with lawmakers, I mean, this is really top of mind for many of us who are really trying to, you know, create change at scale, you know, something that lasts, you know, so I mean, yeah, the big ambition is a policy change, a, a change in a law, a, a lasting change and say, say how the law is applied by, you know, police or justice actors or, or anyone. Um, and, you know, if we're working to, to change behavior with lawmakers, we really want to center our approach around them. And so, you know, yeah, we would need to be sort of like a, a human centered design process, right? We really wanna put that person at the middle and look at what, what motivates them. And you're right, what are their opportunities? Where might they be stopped? And where might they feel, you know, the push and the support um, to move forward with a change, maybe to take some risks, you know, that maybe not everybody would love, but if they feel like there's a strong constituency behind them, calling for this, you know, they might really feel the opportunity to, to push ahead and, 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 and deal with some of that resistance, some of that backlash. So yeah, it's so important. I think that your presentation really highlighted how important it is to just really focus on like, who are we trying to change behavior with and what motivates them? Um, so I think in those ways, that's, that's super valuable. Um, and, and on the question of, of, what if I'm suppressed? What if I'm trying to, to speak out or I have spoken out, but I feel like I'm being held back? And I think that one thing to note is that there's, there's often really an important opportunity and power in collective action and sort of getting, you know, really drawing upon the sisterhood if necessary to, to find answers, talk over problems, find solutions together. Um, and, you know, there's certainly a community here and, 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 and in, in every country, really, to where, where that's happening, and if there's an if there's an opportunity to connect with those folks, that's that's that can be super powerful and, and, and game changing. Okay, I see that there's one more question, and we have just a few more minutes for this. So let me look at this question: Why are we not talking about the other service providers or duty bearers in addition to lawyers? Uh, do we have any plan to hand over this strategy model to government? And unless government own and implement it nationally, it will take hundreds of years. Excellent question. It's definitely not just you know lawmakers and, and, and justice practitioners that we need to be working with. It's health and social welfare and, and all types of, you know, even you know, labor, Ministry of Labor, for example. Um, so there's there's a broad scope of, of actors we want to be working with. So um, maybe Shravana, do you want to speak really quickly to that about some of those important actors besides you know justice side that, that you're you're speaking to? Um. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, so in terms of like, you know, uh, when we talk about the duty, uh, duty bearers, and if we talk about the duty bearers, then it's also like, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's a lawmaker or coming from a health institutions or anyone. So it's about the right holders are actually making the lawmakers accountable. So when we try to change the behaviors, their current behaviors into a desired future behavior where they will be much more responsible and then make the institutions uh, uh the more accountable, then it is also like um, important to recognize their like you know their positions as um, Erin actually mentions that whether there it is not only the willingness, it also needs to, needs to be much more beyond the willingness because willingness doesn't bring the responsibility. It's, we have to distinguish the accountability and responsibility, and it is important that. Um, 
we recognize and then with the like you know communicate and also the capacity building of their staff as a like you know to, uh, in a collective voice it cannot be just a one institutions so uh if i give an example in bangladesh there is a, like a high court directive to establish a sexual harassment prevention committees in every institutions that means that public and private institutions including education institutions in 2020 uh, so it was published and uh, the directive was given in 2009 and then after 10 years that it is only 50 universities it actually established uh, in uh, the sec- complaint committees or in their own education institution so you can imagine like you know the slow progress of the implementations because even like you know starting with this complaint committee like you know and then there is a long way to go and that, so it takes time but then at the same time it's also need uh, required to have a more collective uh, advocacy to not only change the national level policies but also start from the unit of the government institutions public and private as well also so yeah thank you agreed, agreed. thank you so much Ravana. yes i mean we are actively working very hard to bring in those frontline service providers from health, for example, police, to make sure that they're really um, on board and that their leadership is on board in terms of applying applying policies and laws in a fair way, in a way that's victim-centered, victim, you know, sensitive to victims and survivors. So um, yeah, great example as well about what universities are doing and how those types of uh, policies are being applied. Okay, thank you so much for your questions and comments and and to the panel and to the speakers. So thanks to uh, those of you who've been uh, adding some questions and also some of the panel members have already started responding some some of the uh, questions you've put in the the Q&A and also the chat. Um, So we have a little bit of time now, we have around 20 minutes or so to respond to some of these questions. Um, So what I'm going to do just quickly is do a quick review on what's been uh, asked and responded to already in case any of the respondents want to add a bit more. So we and there's and these are I think are excellent questions, by the way, and questions that I think are many, many people have who are designing programs or implementing programs and trying to make important decisions about where do we focus our time and energy. So thanks for for offering these questions. So first, there was something from uh, Nasima who said uh, two things. One, is there evidence in the minimum duration or frequency? of interventions to shift attitudes? And second, once the attitudes have positively changed, what do we need to do to change behavior? So Aaron, I thought I would offer you a chance to you know, explain a little bit about your response and see if you wanna add anything more beyond what you've put in writing. Thanks, Aaron. Sure, thanks, thanks Melissa. Um, sorry, can you just clarify which, which one? Because there were a few of them. Um, oh, so this is the one that you responded in uh, writing on the Q&A. So uh, the first the one is, is there evidence to shift evidence on the minimum duration or frequency? Okay. Yeah. yeah, thanks for that question. Um, yeah, I think it, it really does depend on the attitude that you're trying to change. I think what we do know, though, is that, you know, one off sessions or one off trainings are really not going to be effective. So I think it's hard to say like what is the minimum, but at least the minimum is more than once. You know, I think we, especially because of the kinds of attitudes and beliefs and that we're trying to target and change, these are not something that are just gonna kind of shift quickly. Um, so I think we have a lot of evidence that like one off is really not effective. I think it really does so depend on how strong or rigid the belief is in the community you're working in um, kind of, So that's why knowing your audience and knowing your context is really important to know how intensive or sufficient an awareness raising intervention will be required. Yeah. Thanks, Erin. Okay, so that's a really important point that, um, you know, everything that that we're doing is really designed very specifically about the uh, population that we wanna work with and, you know, how, how far do we need to go really? Uh, Lindsay, I see that your hand is up. Did you want to speak to that question as well? It was actually to the second 
question, if that's possible. So if that's sure. okay, Nasima has asked, um, once attitudes have positively changed, what do we need to do to change behaviors? So I guess I just wanted to stress in response that this is not necessarily linear at all. So sometimes, you know, a person will change their attitude and that attitude or change will be a motivation factor to change the behavior. And then if they've also got maybe the capability and the opportunity is there, they may change the behavior. But sometimes it's not at all linear. So it is actually possible for someone to change a behavior without changing their attitude. So take, for example, um, again, the example of a, a man beating his wife. Let's take that example. So he may change his behavior because he suddenly he, now he understands that it's harmful to his wife and he wants to do that and he shifted his attitude so that ch he may change his attitude and change his behavior but he may continue to think that it's right to believe it, to beat his wife or he wants to beat his wife but he won't he, he will stop beating his wife he'll change his behavior because he fears the sanction he fears that other people will stigmatize him in his community or a police officer will come to arrest him so he may still actually have an attitude that wife beating is okay, but he may change his behavior because that sort of opportunity structure around him has changed. And now he's like, oh, I don't want the consequences of, of beating my wife. So I hope that's sort of just so it's not always linear. And I think it's important for us to kind of understand and see that and to look at these different sort of drivers and not, not just about attitudes and, and motivational factors, but also about capacity and the opportunity structure as well. Very good, thank you. Thank you for illustrating that a bit more, Lindsay. Um, okay, so we have a few more questions. Um, perhaps, so we've got another great question from Nasima. Um, this question is as follows. How specific should the targeted behaviors be? How do we identify the key behavior to change when working on different types of violence against women and girls? So Lindsay, do you want to offer your insights on that one as well? Yeah, and I can have a first go, and I'm sure Erin and Shrabada may have things to say as well. So it's really, and it does relate to another question I saw as well here about, you know, how do we know what the drivers are? And it is really that we, we do need to do research. And so either there might be existing research where people have, have done qualitative and or quantitative research to look at what is driving violence, for example, what are the risk factors, that kind of risk factor analysis, you know, is it about alcohol abuse? Is it about, you know, um, particular ideas about manhood and masculinity, uh, sexual entitlement? You know, is it about, sometimes it may be about depression and mental illness. So really that comes from existing research that we might look at, or also sometimes formative research. So actually, you know, Erin and I have, have done work in, in Rwanda, for example, where we really did research with couples and we did focus groups and we listened to various people around what are the norms and the sort of the drivers of violence and we we used to tell stories about a man and his wife and what would what would you know we'd stop the story and say what would happen next or why might he do that or why not and by really having those discussions you can really unpick the sort of beliefs and the drivers of violence so that's really how 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 we have done it in terms of identifying what those drivers actually actually are yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Erin, do you want to respond to? Sure. Just to follow up on Lindsay, I think it's, you know, really useful to, um, you know, this, these kinds of models can help diagnose how specific the behaviors that you want to be changing are for your particular community. But it's important to also reflect, you might identify these behaviors as important to change, but it's just beyond the scope of your intervention to change them. Um, it might require kind of partnership or it might just require different funding or different expertise and then that's okay, but it's still important to be aware because that might explain why your intervention isn't having the impacts you're kind of wanting it to. Um, so, you know, it can, and I think we always are having to choose, we have to focus our interventions, right? But it's still helpful to be aware of what are the specific behaviors that really drive violence in this setting what ones are my intervention not addressing? And that might help explain why or why not getting the results intended and think about if you're going to further implicate, you know, adapt or, or refine the intervention going forward. So just wanted to, to add that as well. Thank you, Erin. Um, and I think that that's a really important point you've raised. I know that there's been a number of questions um, with partners and in other sessions about you know, well, we can only do so much. We have to be 
somewhat specific here in this in this intervention. What about the things that we're not addressing? How are we gonna, you know, how are we gonna get to those? And you're right, uh, it's it's about taking a collective approach. It's about strategizing together and sometimes dividing up the work and deciding like, okay, another partner has an opportunity to take on this other sort of set of, of drivers and, and uh, we can focus in that way uh, through partnership. So thanks for offering some insights about that. Now, I wanna kind of follow on from that last point about the targeted behaviors um, with the question that I think was directed perhaps to Shrabana, uh, which is about how did you find or choose the behavioral drivers? drivers? This is a question from Lorena. Did you do a formative research? What kind, of, oh, what kind of assessment did you do? What kind of research did you do to hone in on uh, the drivers that you focused on? So. Shrabana, would you like to yep. take that one? Yes, thank you, Melissa. And also like very interesting question. So as mentioned that, I mean, like the project we are actually doing is a prevention program. Uh, like, and then it is not it actually, we are not only doing only the BCC strategy implementation. We are also doing different types of prevention uh, implement, uh, approaches in like, you know, implementing and then so when we actually designed the project it was much more like you know we had a scoping study on finding the uh, stakeholders as well as the drivers of violence in the like the project areas so and then also like you know what areas even within the country which particular district or like a local level that we need to actually engage with what kind of behaviors we need to change through different types of prevention approaches not only the behavior change materials but that at the same time also uh different types of prevention measurements that we need to um um like you know uh, implement together all that together and then it's a more like you know, it's a holistic approach and uh, when we talk about this, like, you know, which uh, targeted behavior we want to change, but then this also much more comes back to like, you know, which uh, target group actually we would like to address. So as I, in my presentation, I mentioned about this community uh, behaviors, community members behavior change, but then when you think when we are working with the uh, local government uh, officials, especially with the right holders, and then they don't want to implement or like, you know, they don't want to uh, promote a, like his zero tolerance sexual harassment policy. And then also like, you know, doesn't want to enable an environment for the safety and also like, you know, for the women of the staff and then we need to go beyond it's like it is it doesn't only uh focusing on the behavior change materials but we also have to capacitate them or with the uh like with the training and then also with uh like you know sexual harassment different types of and then also like you know we also focus also the budgeting gender responsive budgeting because without that financing it is not possible to actually bring the changes that we'd like to see as a, like a uh, duty bearers to, uh, to create the enabling environment for the workforce in within their uh, within their institutional realm. So it's a uh, it's a lot of combination of work that needs to be done. At the same time, when we are promoting like a zero tolerance to uh, policy, sexual harassment policy within the institutions, then. As a behavior change materials, we can actually think about like, you know, um, like a poster where it actually talks about like, you know, types of violence. What are the policy policy actually um, provides uh, like enables um, the uh, the right holders in that? And, and then also like, and what are the really changes they've been? So that it's a, like a combination of different approaches. And then also like, and that's how it needs to be done. Uh, yeah. Thank Over you. Over to you, Melissa. Melissa. Thank you. Um, I think you've you've touched on something uh, that was raised earlier, but you've given it an important illustration, which is, you know, these programs, the, um, prevention, are so multi-layered. It's very rare that we can just really hone in and do one thing, uh, even though we might try, right? Uh, but you're right. We have to deal with you know, perhaps resistance among community leaders, it could be even resistance among lawmakers or budget holders to actually commit and follow through on those commitments and, and fund those commitments. So sometimes the, the behavior change that we're looking for is really multi-pronged and we're really working across so many levels. Um, it's never just about the adoption of a policy or a law, it's about the implementation as well. Um, and, and, and how that gets, gets measured and how, how change gets measured too. So those are some really important examples you've shared, thank you. Um, and, and you also referred to this in the, 
the session that we had uh, last week. We, this is the second of two sessions. And in that session, there were a number of questions about what, how do we address uh, behavior change if our target group is lawmakers? So that was an important discussion. And maybe that's something that some of our colleagues here, other panel members can speak to as well. Um, but before we come to that, I want to acknowledge the questions that have come into the comment and into the chat and to the Q&A around measurement. Um, I see that Marga put in a question around uh, measuring results. It could be interesting to use control groups um, to measure results among two different locations or groups. Um, one where the strategy was applied, the other one where it wasn't applied, and, and Aaron did respond to that already. Do you want to say a bit more about that, Aaron, about your response to that? And there's also this other question in the Q&A, how would you, could you share some strategies on how we can measure behavior change? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, I think ultimately having um, a baseline for the behavior that we're trying to change, and as you were saying, um, so, uh, Margarita, having a control group is, is a very rigorous approach to be able to say, okay, does this intervention actually change these specific behaviors? But as we know, I mean, those randomized control tiles are very costly. It really depends on your feasibility and budget. And there are a lot of other approaches that can be really useful, um, especially to measure processes of change. So actually why and how behaviors change and among who, or you know, some people have, behaviors change more than others. And this is where I think qualitative and process evaluations are really helpful to understand the kind of limitations of change or the challenges of changing our behaviors or um, you know, how it's linked to implementation quality. Um, if you're, for instance, have a curriculum approach that's trying to change behaviors, like really knowing, you know, is there an ample opportunity to practice skills? Like how are the facilitator dynamics with participants? Um, do people feel motivated and incentivized to change their kind of behaviors? And that can help understand if and how and why behaviors change. So I think, um, you know, it really does obviously depend on the behavior you're trying to change, but I think being really cognizant of these mixed methods approaches can really give us a fuller picture of not only what behaviors are changing, but why and how they change. Very good, thank you so much. Lindsay, did you want to add something to that as well? Please go ahead. Yeah, just a small thing to compliment Erin and just, you know, I guess in terms of some, you know, practical questions as well. I mean, a, a kind of question that you can ask um, either quantitatively actually in a survey or through qualitative research is like asking, so if you're working with their intimate partners, for example, you could ask, both the man and the wife, and usually we do that separately. So that's quite important also to sort of triangulate. <laughs> so if the man says, you know, I'm changing my behavior and she said, no, he's not, then that's quite important. But, you know, one thing, for example, is to ask them, um, and, and you can do this at baseline and, and partway through and at the end, you know, the last time or the last three times you had a disagreement with your wife or your husband, you know, how did you resolve it? So, you know, if you're asking that quantitatively, they, they could be choosing options about, you know, we had time out or I hit her or whatever. Um, if you're doing that qualitatively, you can obviously make that more exploratory. Um, but that is, you know, it's quite an important measure of change. You know, at the beginning of your program, each time they have a disagreement, there's a, there's a physical fight. And then partly through the program, maybe one time, you know, if he's he might be talking and she may agree that, you know, he... He, at least on one of those occasions, he, they took time out. They used one of the strategies being taught them. And he might then say, you know, the other two times I was, it was habitual, it was automatic, but I shift my, my behavior once. So, you know, and doing that, and, and, and I think we would argue that having quantitative and qualitative research is essential. Well, I would definitely argue that for the reasons that 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 Erin said around understanding the how and why, and also the opportunity to triangulate answers as well. Yeah. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, and I think that you've, you've both of you touched on something that's, I think, a really important conversation that's kind of picked up momentum lately around measurement and the fact that not every program will have the ability to run a randomized control track. Just as that's just reality, we know that. Um, and also not every program will perhaps, yeah, just have the means to, to do that kind of exercise. But, there's lots of other learning we can still do. And I think that a number of experts on, focused on prevention are calling for 
you know, really a, a broader scope for capturing knowledge, for capturing that change, and for sort of honoring the practice-based knowledge that is that does emerge from field level interventions as well, and really creating more space for that to be seen and for us to learn from that um, globally and you know across countries and regions. So do you want to do you want to say anything about that? I think that you've you've got thoughts about that as well. That could be for you, Lindsay, sure, or or Aaron. Yeah, I mean, so I think, yes, I think, Melissa, that is the thing. I mean, we're, you know, funnily enough, at the moment, we're in the, in the collaborative and we'll let people know when we're doing that. We, we are exactly looking at this question about sort of right sizing um, monitoring and evaluation. So, you know, if you've got like a $20 million program, you can possibly afford an RCT, even with a few arms and a few things. But if you've got like a $150,000 or a $100,000 program, you're never going to afford an RCT. So it really is about right sizing that both the sort of size of your program and your budget, but also to the questions as well. I mean, sometimes we're actually more interested in, you know, we always want to know something about impact, but sometimes we really want to learn how changes happen. Our, our questions for our program are, are learning ones. Um, and so, you know, we want to think about the methods there. And I think, you know, there are quite a lot of, you know, as I was saying earlier, quite a lot of innovative techniques, um, particularly qualitative techniques, which really involve in participatory techniques, which really involve people in analyzing their own realities, analyzing their, own change stories to see how sort of interventions have worked and um, help us to kind of refine um, interventions and particularly when we're piloting I mean I, I find RCTs have a really important role but they're often wrongly used they're often used you know right at the beginning when you've just designed a new intervention and you know RCTs also place constraints on like how you can move and how you can adapt whereas actually at that first stage of testing a new intervention in a new context we actually need to do sort of qualitative research really and just step back and see how it's working or maybe if we're doing a curriculum observe sessions chat to the facilitator how did that go talk to participants afterwards you know did that example resonate with you you know we need to do that kind of work to really sort of refine and develop interventions before we start doing a massive quantitative study and so i think this is a really important message of, 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 of that we need to get out more in the prevention field because it's become a bit sort of the gold standard to an rct but it's sometimes totally inappropriate actually mm, right can, right and i think oh, that uh, oh sorry uh rita was that you yes okay i'm sorry sorry aaron please go ahead Oh, sorry, Melissa, I'll, I just wanted to follow up on, on Lindsay. And I think, um, you know, I think where practice-based knowledge is, it's really critical for actually understanding both awareness raising interventions and our behavior change interventions. And if we think about some of those things that we know that underlie effective awareness raising interventions, understanding um, the kind of quality of implementation, if it was implemented as intended, how people engage with the program, that's where that practice-based knowledge is so valuable. Um, just an example that came to mind was an evaluation that was done at the MTV Sugar program in Nigeria, which is kind of a, it's, it's both awareness raising, it was an edutainment series. And they did some really interesting focus groups. And one of the things they found through just talking to people about what they liked and didn't like about the program was, was they found that people that really related to the characters in the show, so it, it's a kind of dramatized soap opera uh, with a character with an IPV plot throughout the story. And so they were looking at how attitudes towards violence have changed this final evaluation. But just through these informal focus groups, they found that people who really related to the characters or who remembered the characters were more likely to report change in attitudes and behaviors around violence. And so that's sort of something that got captured around, okay, we know that that seems to be really important then how relatable the show is. Do people remember them? And that's the kind of implementation quality um, and that you learn from this kind of practice. And so I think that's just an example of, that applies more to even an awareness raising intervention, but that can really help you understand if and why your behaviors are changing or attitudes are changing. And then I also think it can help. Sometimes we might be thinking, oh, it's because of this behavioral driver is that a program's not working, but it also might just be linked to implementation quality and, and so, or it not being implemented as intended, which is where I think, again, this practice-based knowledge is so valuable. Mm, right. Very good, thank you. Well, I really appreciate you both underlining the value of 
not only RCTs to measure change on prevention, but other types of qualitative uh, information that we're gathering through a, a variety of sources. And most programs are, are having that, that engagement already. And it's really a sense of um, needing to just be really intentional about how we measure change and progress and capture, you know, what does engage people, what doesn't, what feels like it's, it's, it's having an effect, what, what does feel like it's shifting people internally and, and, and how can we continue to leverage that? Maybe we can do more about that. Uh, you know, we can keep that, keep carrying that forward uh, if that's something that is, that is having an effect. So um, there's, there's huge value in doing that. And that's something that is not incredibly costly. Uh, so there's, there's really important room for that. So I want to thank you all. Um, I think we're going we're gonna to move to close this segment of today's event. So thank you so much to all three of you for responding to questions uh, from the audience members. Um, it's been such a pleasure to hear from all of you. And uh, it's my pleasure to hand it back over to our colleague, Rita, from the Prevention Collaborative, who's going to bring us to the close of today's session. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Melissa, and many thanks to our panelists, Erin, Lindsay, and Shrabana. This is for, was such a great sharing. Uh, we appreciate that you shared your time and expertise with us today. Um, I just wanted to say quickly that at the Prevention Collaborative, we have been partnering over, of, with other organizations uh, to kind of, you know, accompany them to go through the process of understanding and tailoring the prevention programming, but, you know, we could have done that more effectively. So thanks for the briefs and, uh, and, and thanks for sharing the insights today. So our panelists have shared great insights and thanks for uh, sending questions for more discussions. And we also appreciate the examples that were shared by all of you especially Shrabana. And here is for, from me to share a little bit of the highlights that I picked. Um, there is need to be intentional in our programming and in, in our pl planning as we program, right? And we need to be really clear about what different strategies can and cannot accomplish. And I recognize that, you know, this is really clearly um, linked to what Erin presented as she talked about awareness raising. Uh, we also need to carefully think through what changes we want to see and who we want to change and then to consider their capacities their motivation and opportunity you know Lindsay highlighted that in her presentation and similarly we we need to recognize the focus and the need to focus and go through the process to ensure there is clarity and buy-in and this is really what Shrabana took us through with the examples of the program that they've been implementing. So I wanted just to acknowledge the great insights from the presenters and the sharing in the chat box. And before we close, I wanted us to take another look at the Mentimeter to see uh, how the understanding of awareness raising, behavior change may have changed throughout this session. Okay, we have our question up there. So the only one question we have for you before we close is, what is your key takeaway from today's session? What is that thing that you're taking away from this, which could be different from what you came to the session with? If you could share using the same way you used in the Mantimeter, yeah, there come some answers. Yeah, practice-based knowledge can help understand how to change attitudes and behavior through. Yeah, may have been doing awareness raising wrong. So glad to see that there's some unlearning, great. Ideas to measure behavior change, good. Measurement of prevention related change is key. Yes, it is. However, not only qualitative is valuable, qualitative, evidence is useful too, I agree. The approaches to, of capability, motivation and opportunity. Thank you, Lindsay, for the combi model that you shared. Know your community to know your response. That's important, I agree. How to change behavior and learn knowledge and how to raise awareness. 
this is important. So the two briefs really brought some, they gave some key takeaways and this is interesting to know. Great, some more answers coming. Yeah, awareness raising and behavior change could be complementary. Five key strategies for behavior change, bottom up based on research. Wonderful insights that we're taking away. And thank you so much for sharing the insights that you're taking away. And um, before we close the webinar, as we're closing, actually, I just wanted to let you know that the two briefs, uh, I think Melissa mentioned this as well, will be published on our respective websites, you know, Prevention Collaborative and UN Women in the coming days, the, second, the two days I heard. Um, we will share the links as well as the recording of this session via email in the coming days. So you, you, you heard from Melissa that it was a second. It was a second uh, of um, uh, last week we had one, the same webinar in another uh, different time zone. So we will be sharing. And before ending, I would like really to thank UN Women and especially the country offices for the opportunity to collaborate with us, uh, with the Prevention Collaborative closely to have this done. And once again, thank you, Melissa, Erin, Lindsay, and Shabana for your valuable contribution. And thanks to the audience for your time and interest and the sharing through the chat box and the question. And we appreciate the engagement that you've shown throughout this uh, webinar. So with that, you've seen that we want you to stay in touch, stay connected with us. And I have the honor of closing this webinar. Thank you so much. <laughs>